next presentation is something that I've been looking forward to actually. Um, and this is Lauren Tuscula, who is, did I say that right, Lauren? That's right, yep. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, whose topic is uh, very, very uh, appealing uh, to me at least because it involves Frank Bancroft, who uh, was an exceptional person in my uh, view of things uh, in the 19th century uh, the capacity as a manager. Uh, and uh, her presentation is completely titled Frank Bancroft and the Blackstone Valley's 19th century baseball legacy. And uh, she'll explain a little bit about that. By the way, uh, I just got it from uh, Bob Bailey, who is still unfortunately without any form of email or uh, you know, his cable went out down there. Uh, hopefully he'll be able to join us very, very soon. But he also informed me that um, Lauren uh, actually played softball uh, <laughs> for Amherst University and uh, I, some school called Amherst, <laughs> <laughs> which we all kind of know. But uh, and I think she batted 419 in, in uh, 2017. So, uh, so just in case you're wondering, <laughs> Lauren, I think uh, let me welcome you and uh, let me welcome you to for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. I appreciate it, and um, thank you and for your slide. Me. Your slides are up and ready to go. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you, Peter, and thank you um, for all the organizing you've done, too. I really appreciate it. And thank you for mentioning my batting average, too. <laughs> I'll always take it. So, um, hi, everyone. And as Peter said, my name is Lauren Tuscula, and today I'm presenting to you from Leicester, Massachusetts, which is about a 10-minute drive from Polar Park in Worcester, um, which is the new home of the Red Sox AAA affiliate Worcester Red Sox. So, um, as you can tell from my title, Today, I'll be discussing legendary baseball manager Frank Bancroft and the impact the Blackstone Valley had on his contributions to the game. I'll also briefly discuss the industrialization of the Blackstone Valley and the role of baseball in the Valley throughout the late 19th century. So to get started, I want to quickly set the scene and context for this discussion. Oh, there we go. So in 1828, the Blackstone Canal opened along the Blackstone River connecting the growing cities of Providence, Rhode Island, and Worcester, Massachusetts. This change revolutionized the economic landscape of the region, finally allowing goods to travel between the two industrial hubs and leading to greater industrialization throughout the region. So up on the screen here, this is a map that lands us in the Blackstone Valley, and the span from Worcester to Providence is about a 46-mile span. Just over 50 years after the canal opened on June 12, 1880, J. Lee Richmond, who was a student at Brown University at the time, traveled by train from Providence to Worcester for a game with Worcester's 1880 team in the National League. Richmond would throw a perfect game that day, the first perfect game in baseball history, just one of many pivotal moments in the game's history, partially made possible by the industrialization of the Blackstone Valley region. And up here on the screen, this is the scorecard from Richmond's perfect game. I found it th um, through research at the Worcester Historical Museum. I now know that the Baseball Hall of Fame has this in the archives. Um, but if you see here down at the bottom, it says the first no hit, no run game. So they weren't calling it a perfect game at the time. But of course, so this, this slide is the Worcester team. And as um, Peter said, I was a pitcher. I was a lefty pitcher, just like Richmond. So I wanted to see the other side showing the batters. And when I was initially looking at the Worcester Historical Museum, um, we couldn't find it right away. So a little more digging, we did get that reverse side. And um, this side, slide here shows those that perfect game and um, the batter striking out. This is the Cleveland side. And then over on the right, this is a marker at present day Becker College in Worcester showing the spot at the Worcester Agricultural Fairgrounds where he threw that perfect game. But the marker itself, it's pretty small and it's unassuming. You really have to know what you're looking for in order to find it. But um, it is there and that's a picture of it right there. So Richmond's appearance in Worcester can be credited to the team's new manager, Frank Bancroft. Bancroft had been hired by Worcester thanks to his proven ability to draw in fans and money with his new Bedford team in the Athletic Association. So today I'll be discussing Bancroft's life in baseball and his enduring contributions to the game. 
I'll also highlight the rapidly changing economic landscape throughout the villages and towns of the Blackstone Valley at the end of the 19th century. Bancroft's baseball contributions were impacted by baseball fans throughout the mill towns up and down the Blackstone. When Bancroft joined with the 1879 Worcester team, he committed to, quote, afford the citizens of Worcester an innocent summer's amusement, which here in New Bedford is patronized by the elite of the city. Bancroft's efforts catered to the shifting baseball fan base of the 19th century, allowing for a new class of fans to attend. All patrons throughout the Blackstone Valley would soon be able to attend a game, partially thanks to, baseball's, to Bancroft's baseball innovations. So I'll provide some additional background on Bancroft, followed by a brief overview of those milk communities in New England and the economic landscape at the turn of the 19th century. From there, I'll dive into Bancroft's lasting baseball contributions, which include advocating for Sunday games, popularizing double headers, and celebrating opening day. And just one more small note before I continue, as I'm sure many of you are wondering how a millennial became interested in 19th century baseball history. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, I was working as the team historian slash researcher for the Worcester Red Sox, helping to prepare for the team's upcoming inaugural season here in Worcester, and opening day is May 11th. But while that pandem the pandemic put that official work on pause, I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to learn more about the rich baseball history throughout Worcester County. And as an avid baseball fan and softball player who grew up here in central Massachusetts, I was fascinated by Worcester's contributions to our nation's pastime and Frank Bancroft's, Frank, Frank Bancroft's impactful legacy. So all of that is just to say, I'm so grateful to Sabre for the opportunity and resources to explore this topic and to share my work with other passionate baseball fans. So now that all that's out of the way, here's some more background on legendary baseball manager, Frank Bancroft. Frank Bancroft was born in Lancaster, Massachusetts, which is about 20 miles north of Worcester on May 9th, 1846. He grew up on his grandfather's farm in Lancaster, learning about the ups and downs of running a business firsthand. In 1861, at just 15 years old, Bancroft enlisted with the 8th Regiment of the New Hampshire Volunteers, using a fake name and lying about his age in order to serve in the Civil War. He was discharged in 1865 and eventually returned to Massachusetts, this time to Holyoke, where he worked in a textile mill, which was his last job in manual labor. I like to think that in those future moments, advocates, advocating for those baseball scheduling changes, which allowed hardworking farm and mill workers to enjoy, enjoy a ball game, Bancroft remembered his early days spent as a manual laborer on the farm and in the mills. After working in the mill in Holyoke, Bancroft began his career in the hotel business. He moved around New Hampshire throughout the 1870s, working as the manager of a boarding house and as a hotel clerk before eventually landing in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, which is the former home of the Red Sox AAA affiliate Paw Sox. While working as proprietor of the Benedict House in Pawtucket, which the Benedict House is pictured here on the right on the slide, Bancroft showed the early signs of his innovative business savvy expanding to the theater industry and managing a comedy act. Theater had previously been exclusively reserved for the city's elite, but was at a time of transition thanks to the emergence of vaudeville productions. Bancroft entered theater at a time when productions were beginning to cater to the middle class by charging popular prices for their tickets. This increase in accessibility foreshadows Bancroft's contributions throughout his business career in baseball. In 1876, Bancroft returned to Massachusetts once again to run the Bancroft House Hotel in New Bedford. He remained tied to the theater industry, advertising to quote, managers, agents, and companies visiting New Bedford. So now that we have that brief background on Bancroft's career prior to baseball, I'll now dive into his career within the game. In 1877, Bancroft gathered investors to construct and operate the Kempton Street Grounds, a new ballpark in New Bedford, which hosted amateur and semi-pro games and accommodated a crowd of 800 fans. In 1878, he moved on from the field to his first work with the team, starting a new ball club in New Bedford, which competed in the International Association. In the announcement of the team's formation, 
Bancroft was praised for his, quote, good executive abilities and sound judgment with predictions of success for the new team. And those predictions did prove to be accurate. Bancroft utilized his prior experience with the touring theater companies to maximize opportunities for his team to play and, of course, to increase his own earnings. The new Bedford team played 130 games that year, the most played by any club in those days. And they saw success in that competition, winning the unofficial championship of New England. Bancroft's efforts to increase his earnings even resulted in an 1878 4th of July triple header between his New Bedford team and Hartford. They began the day with an 8 a.m. game in New Bedford, which Bancroft's team won 15 to one. Both clubs then traveled by train to Taunton for an 11.30 contest, which New Bedford won three to one. And the two nines ended the day in Providence, Rhode Island for a 4 p.m. contest, which ended in a lopsided 18 to three victory for the New Bedford side. Following Bancroft's great success in New Bedford, the Worcester minor league team hired him for the 1879 season. In Worcester, Bancroft composed another packed schedule with the team playing 125 games, the most of any club that year. Bancroft's time in Worcester also resulted in the aforementioned arrival of Lee Richmond, who is referred to as a quote, phenomenal pitcher in an 1879 New York Clipper profile on Bancroft. Little did that writer know the phenomenal pitcher would go on to throw baseball's first ever perfect game at the Worcester Agricultural Fairgrounds, which was located at present day Becker College. And that was the marker I showed earlier. And up here on the screen, this is a photo of the 1880 Worcester team. So after the 1879 Worcester minor league season, they went to the National League in 1880. So this is a photo, there's Bancroft at the center and then in the top left, there's Richmond. And this photo, um, has actually been hanging in my house in the basement for my entire life. And I would walk past it and didn't really know anything about it. But then of course, when I dove into the research, I realized just how special this piece really was. So now that we have this background on Bancroft's early career in baseball, I'd like to transition to a closer look at the mill communities of the Blackstone Valley and their connection to baseball. I'm sure many of you have heard of the Blackstone Valley League which ran from 1925 to 1955 and produced major leaguers such as Hall of Famers Gabby Hartnett and Hank Greenberg. Prior to that famed league, the mill communities of the Blackstone Valley grew and flourished thanks to industrialization throughout the late 19th century and baseball played a pivotal role in that development. The villages of the 19th century Blackstone Valley operated under a strict hierarchical order Fearing that widespread industrialization would lead to an unruly working class, owners and employers assumed the role of overseer, managing the villages to ensure decorum was upheld. This rigid structure meant that workers had little control over their daily lives. From their homes, to their work schedules, to their food, mill owners in the village controlled nearly all of it. But that's where baseball came in. Along with other recreational activities, Playing and watching baseball offered an escape from the monotony. The game was an opportunity to break away from the intense control exercised over these workers' lives. Even prior to the company-sponsored Blackstone Valley Baseball League of the early 20th century, mill workers often spent their limited free time playing and watching the game. I'd also like to note here that this introduction of baseball into mill workers' lives was more complicated than it appears to be on the surface. Baseball offered a respite from the grueling working conditions of the mills, but its implementation was also strategic. As fears of growing labor unrest mounted, owners looked for new ways to improve relations with their employees. Baseball and other organized sports helped to create a sense of camaraderie amongst the workforce and helped to improve relations between workers and their companies. So with that said, while owners might have strategically introduced the game for their own benefit, baseball undoubtedly improved the lives of mill workers at the time. And another key factor to consider is that much of the workforce of the rapidly industrializing 19th century Blackstone Valley were immigrants. There were Irish, French Canadian, Swedish, Italian, Polish, Ukrainian, Armenian workers, and much more. The wave of industrialization in the Valley brought with it an entirely new workforce 
changing the demographics of the valley. And that change can still be seen today in Worcester County's unique diversity. An indication of this cultural shift was on display in the Farnhamsville village located in present day Grafton, Massachusetts. And Grafton is just outside of Worcester. When the Farnhamsville mill switched from producing cotton to spinning and weaving wools, they needed to employ new workers and turn to the skilled workforce from England. Upon arrival, those English workers turned green spaces into cricket pitches as a way to assert and express their own cultural identity. But those cricket pitches were short-lived as green spaces quickly transformed again into baseball fields, highlighting the way the game was taking hold amongst immigrant populations. I note the workforce and these changes in the context of what we know today about baseball as America's pastime. With the game being played so often in the mill villages of mill villages of the valley, baseball became a point of entry to America for this immigrant workforce, connecting back to Bancroft's larger legacy in growing the game into a global sport. Another example of Bancroft's influence in broadening the game's reach is his postseason trip to Cuba in December 1879, the first documented trip of a North American pro team traveling to Cuba. After a successful season in Worcester, Bancroft organized a trip for some team members, team members, including notable players such as Art Irwin and Charlie Bennett, to travel to Cuba for exhibition games under the team name Hot Bitters, which was named after the medicine manufactured by the sponsor of the team, Asa Sewell. Although that Cuba trip was brief, the impact was lasting, helping to launch the Cuban Professional League's inaugural season. Bancroft's savvy and persistent as a manager was also on display in Cuba. Upon learning that a team from the US was making its way to the island, Cuba's governor general imposed a tax on the gate receipts from any contest played. The Spanish government would collect 50% of the receipts or the team wouldn't be allowed to charge admission for the games. Bancroft located an American entrepreneur in Havana who sponsored the remainder of the team's trip. They played Sunday games and didn't charge admission, circumventing the tax imposed by the Spanish government. And tangentially returning to Bancroft's involvement in shaping the legacy of baseball as America's game, he also distributed US flags throughout Havana to promote the Hopbitters tour, a move that caused him to be taken into custody and interrogated before being released on the condition that he not distribute any more American flags. And over here on the left, this is a Hopbitters advertisement they often use that American flag imagery in their advertisements for the medicine. So although that Cuba trip was brief and ultimately unprofitable for Bancroft and the Hopbitters, in the words of an 1897 Sporting Life article on Bancroft, the trip, quote, paved the way and made other visits there of American teams profitable, unquote. Thanks to this first trip and others in the early 20th century, Bancroft has been referred to as the father of Cuban baseball. And even before baseball was truly established as America's pastime, Bancroft's efforts both at home in the Blackstone Valley and abroad with his hot bitters tour planted the seeds to help grow baseball into the global game it is today. In the years following his work with Worcester in 1879 and 1880, Bancroft bounced around between various leagues, working with so many teams that he would eventually come to hold the unofficial record for most teams managed in baseball. After stints in Detroit and Cleveland, Bancroft returned to the Blackstone Valley in 1884, managing the Providence Grays of the National League. So here's a team photo of the Grays, and then there in the center is Bancroft circled in red. While he was in Providence, Bancroft collaborated with the Providence and Worcester Railroad to sell coupon tickets covering both the train fare and entry to the ballpark for games played on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Legendary pitcher Haas Radborn led Providence to the National League title that season, and Bancroft arranged for a series between the Grays and that year's American Association champion, the Metropolitan Club of New York City. While he wasn't advocating for fans in the Valley to see their Providence team, the series is yet another example of Bancroft's success as a businessman. He negotiated for all three games to be played in the more populous city of New York, drawing a larger crowd than would turn out in Providence. 
while it would be nice to make an argument that this push raised the profile of Providence contributing back to the Valley, I think it's safe to say this move boiled down to purely the bottom line. That series, which Providence swept three games to none, gave Bancroft credit for yet another baseball first, as it's now come to be known as the first World Series. So for the sake of time, I'll jump ahead to Bancroft's career outside of New England toward the end of the 19th century, when he made many of the enduring baseball contributions that we remember him for today. And while many of these contributions did come after his career took him out of New England, that combination of his time as a youth spent growing up on a farm in Lancaster, and his engagement with the audiences of New England certainly shaped these contributions and his decisions as a baseball manager. The fight over Sunday baseball is well documented, and we heard more about that in Dennis's great presentation on Thursday night, and Bancroft was among Sunday baseball's many advocates. Following a, following a year away from baseball in 1890, Bancroft joined the Cincinnati team of the American Association. In 1892, he was hired as business manager of the Reds, a job which allowed him to focus solely on the business side of baseball, rather than worrying about the on-field product. In Cincinnati, Bancroft developed a system that allowed the team to host profitable Sunday games, working out a deal with law enforcement, which allowed the team to pay a fine for Sunday games, rather than being forced to go through those lengthy jury trials. In advocating for Sunday games, Bancroft said, quote, Sunday games devoid of intoxicating drinks are in every way moral and healthy. They afford hours recreation to thousands of clerks, mechanics, et cetera, who are shut up all week and can't attend a weekday game. Reminiscent of those hardworking laborers back in the Blackstone Valley. And because they allowed for a broader audience to attend, Sunday games drew the largest crowds. Ever the businessman, Bancroft scheduled his Reds to play on as many Sundays as possible. He would even have the Reds travel in the middle of their homestand in the event that the team they were playing at the time did not compete on Sundays. He innovatively found ways to bring baseball to as many people as possible and to pull in as much money as possible while he was doing it. And consistent with that guiding principle of lining his pocket while also making baseball accessible, that goal is made clear in a revealing 1919 American Magazine profile of Bancroft. He said, quote, it doesn't hurt anyone to send a kid through the styles. It does the youngster a lot of good. It lets him see the stars and the game he loves, which is a wonderful sentiment, but Bancroft also had future profits on the mind. It makes him a fan, he continued, and there is a return for us in later years. That spirit of creating fans for life extends to the other enduring baseball tradition Bancroft is known for, celebrating opening day. In addition to being called the father of Cuban baseball, as I discussed earlier, Bancroft holds another paternal moniker and is known as the father of opening day. But even prior to his introduction of opening day festivities, Bancroft found new and exciting ways to entice fans to the ballpark. On September 18th, 1893, he arranged for Lewis Rapp, the Reds' assistant groundskeeper, to be married at League Park's home plate. While I didn't find record of any other weddings, Bancroft did organize festivities for opening day. The tradition of politicians attending opening day is now ubiquitous, but Bancroft had his hand in another baseball first when Cincinnati Mayor John Caldwell became the first mayor to attend a season opener and throw out the first pitch. Caldwell's first pitch was actually more of a handoff as he simply passed the ball to the umpire in 1895. The next year, the mayor decided to give an actual pitch a try, sailing his throw over the ump's head and giving the sport its first wild pitch in opening day history. And there were near sellout numbers at the park that day to witness the errant throw, thanks to Bancroft's efforts to popularize what is now an unofficial holiday for all baseball fans. And there's yet another term in our everyday baseball vernacular we can thank Bancroft for, doubleheader. While doubleheaders were already being played mostly on holidays with separate admission charged for each game, Bancroft introduced the idea of playing two games for the price of one on non-holidays. As noted in an 1898 Cincinnati Inquirer article, quote, Bancroft is responsible for doubleheader being used to designate two games for one price of admission. 
Banny advertised his double attraction as a double header, and it was not long until every club in the league was using the term. Bancroft would even schedule three team double headers for Sundays, another effort to attract more fans to the ballpark, reminiscent of the July 4th triple header Bancroft had scheduled back in New England. He did not miss an opportunity to make an extra buck and make another fan for life. Bancroft's baseball career carried over into the new century, highlighted by two additional tours to Cuba, one in 1908 and one in 1909. He worked as the Reds' business manager through the 1920 season, well into his 70s. Bancroft's career took him through seven major league teams, which is an informal record for most teams managed by any person. And the contributions I've outlined here clearly still endure today. We all celebrated opening day earlier this month. The game's connection to Cuba is well documented and clear when turning on any major league game today. And what would a spring or summer Sunday be without baseball? All of these contributions are what we remember Bancroft for, but I'd like to return to his quote ahead of his move from the 1878 New Bedford team to Worcester in 1879. Bancroft said he hoped, quote, to afford the citizens of Worcester an innocent summer's amusement, which here in New Bedford is patronized by the elite of the city. That guiding principle carried him through his years as a baseball manager, leading him to introduce these many baseball innovations, send a kid through the styles, and along the way shape the game that has made us all fans for life. Thank you. Lauren, let me let me welcome you to our merry band. <laughs> you you obviously uh, have a, not only the uh, the passion to do this research, but also I mean you have the uh, you know great research experience and uh, you know you put it all together. Uh, Thank you. I, w I wanted to mention something to how I came across Bancroft uh, was that. I did a bio project many years ago on uh, Jim Mutry of the uh, New York, you know, who, who was managing the Metropolitans mm -hmm. uh, when he and Frank Brancourt played the first World Series game. And a World Series of uh, three games, actually, uh, the third being unnecessary. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, it is interesting because Mutri actually played for Bancroft uh, up in the Blackstone Valley. And uh, it was back uh, uh, before, you know, Mutri uh, came to New York City uh, to create the Metropolitans in a sense in 1880. So as an independent team and, uh, and then went on to, uh, uh, you know, fame with the, uh, both the Metropolitans and the Giants. Uh, I see that our co-chair Bob Bailey is back and live and, <laughs> and still with us. Okay, good. I feel relieved. <laughs> All right. I wanted to ask uh, a couple of observations were made while you were speaking. And one was that um, uh, that Lee Richmond is actually buried in Forest Cemetery in Toledo, Ohio, in case anybody is interested. Uh, but that monument, that marker is incredible. And uh, of course he is, you know, that is a very famous game in baseball history being that, you know, it was that perfect game. Uh, Peter Morris noted that uh, at the time when Bancroft created uh, the team for the hot bidders, that Henry Chadwick, who of course, you know, has this, uh, moniker as the uh, father of baseball was really the father of baseball writers in a sense. Uh, he abhorred the idea of a team being <laughs> named for commercial interest. Uh, <laughs> any comments on that? <laughs> I, I see that comment there, yeah. And another thing with the hot bitters, I was reading through the advertisements and all of the things it claimed it was going to cure. And that's this, it's similar to the commercials we hear now of the side effects of all the things that could go wrong. It's, it claimed it could cure everything too. So that is interesting. <laughs> right. Chadwick should only be around today to see the names of some of our stadiums. Yeah. 
Uh, does anybody, uh, let me see, everybody, you're getting a lot of well done and incredible presentations here as comments uh, when you get a chance. When you, if you hit your own chat button, you'll be able to uh, see some of those. Yeah, it says here that Mutri was a shortstop for the New Bedford Club in 1878. <laughs> he wasn't such a good, uh, a good player, but he turned out to be a very decent manager. Uh, okay. Uh, so, Lori, I want to thank you so much. Uh, I I, uh, I hope that uh, you will collaborate with us again and uh, be a presenter sometime in the future again. And uh, you're certainly welcome to any involvement in the 19th Century Committee. Uh, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of activities. That I'm sure you it'll uh, it may interest you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.